Right, it's October 1st, 2020. Uh, today it marks the week, we now it's week six, everyone, uh, of our uh, policy committee meeting, which is extraordinary. Uh, we are very thrilled to welcome uh, our co-chairs, uh, Mayor Dean, as well as Mr. Lewis, uh, to offer his opening remarks and important announcements and guidance here. And so before we uh, jump into our agenda, I want to extend the floor uh, to these gentlemen and welcome Mayor Dean and Mr. Lewis. Dwight, you want to go ahead? I'd just like to, uh, Mayor Dean, thank you. I'd just like to echo, echo what you told the uh, members of the community, community's uh, committee a uh, short while ago, that that you're just you know impressed by the work that they've been doing, and I'm sure the policy committee uh, uh, policy committee has been doing great work as well. Uh, you know, here six weeks, I'm just getting on board and trying to catch up, and you, you have a a great task and uh, you're doing a great deed. So I just want to applaud your work and, and I'm available if you need me. Great, thank you, Dwight. Thank you. Glad to have you with us too. Um, let me, um, I wanted to say, say, say a few words. First of all, um, to echo Dwight, thank you for uh, all your hard work to this committee. Uh, I think we know we've asked a lot and you all have been um, working real hard. But we're at a point now where we have a couple important dates coming up. And the most important one is, right now is Friday the 9th, where we're asking for um, uh, recommendations um, from all of the committees to be turned in. Um, and the importance of that is, is after the, the 9th, there's gonna be a meeting with the basically the data group and the the, um, the chairs and vice chairs of the committees to kind of bring things together in the morning of the 14th and then make a presentation um, to Mayor Cooper um, uh, at lunch on the 14th. And there's still time for, if there are things that need to be looked at with more detail or people want to uh, present more information, we can do that after the 14th too. But we need uh, to be mindful of the fact that in terms of the selection of the police chief, um, you probably saw in the paper that the mayor has appointed a group of five to um, basically screen through the 20 to 25 applications that have been turned in to get it down to a manageable number. And we wanna be in a position to uh, use the work that you all have done to give questions that should be presented to these candidates also to give them overriding vision of what the community, what the people of Nashville represented by you, think that we want in a new police chief or what we want from a police department. So those are the, those things are coming up. And, and you know, I don't know when the decision will be made as to, and John can speak to this better than I can about a new chief, but we want the, in November to be able to produce our product uh, from this group. So. I'm, I'm, I'm here to say thank you, but also to say, um, you know, the, 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 the clock is ticking. We, we're, the ninth is when we're, we have a due date on, 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 on recommendations, and then the 14th we'll actually begin this process of interacting a little bit more with the mayor's office about the questions that we want to pose and the recommendations that we want to make. John, you want to add anything to that? Mayor, Mayor Dean and, and John, before, before John goes ahead, let me just say one other thing. I uh, was asked last Friday to join the commission, but since joining, since coming on board uh, Monday, I've just been Im impressed with the different, uh, the committee members of the workforce. Uh, this is my first time with the policy and the communities meeting. And I just looked at this uh, meeting, getting ready to start. And I see uh, Ms. Brack, uh, she was on the, she was on the uh, communities meeting and you turn over and so it just, just says something about the work that, that you all are putting in. And I, I know the people of Nashville are just, thank, can't, can't thank you all enough. And I thank you for uh, letting me work with you all. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. We welcome you to the, the commission, certainly welcome your leadership here in space and great to see you and Mayor Dean. Uh, partnered in this important endeavor here. John, anything you would add there? I know they were sharing over to you. Yeah, 
John, I believe you're you're on mute there. Apologies. At this point, it's unforgivable. Um, Eric, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about the importance of the meeting on the 14th as well, where we're we're uh, we're going to have uh, a very intensive working session? Uh, yes. So there's a few uh, things, uh, and sorry, Dia could not be on the phone today. She has some prior obligations she had to take care of. Uh, so I'm going to just uh, <clears throat> go to some of uh, her notes. Uh, that she just wanted to make sure of and then um, uh, talk about those as well. So, uh, of course, just like Mayor Dean and also uh, Chair uh, Dwight Lewis has, have discussed, uh, we want to make sure that we keep in mind that due date as far as with uh, draft recommendations. They are due uh, not this Friday, but the next Friday <clears throat> on October 9th, which is, again, of course, one week from tomorrow uh, with the half day planning. Um, we want to make sure that we have these drafts ready so that they'll be the driving force towards the half day planning sessions, uh, which will be included as far as with the chairs, the vice chairs, as well as the uh, data commit the data committee members for Wednesday's uh, meeting of the half day. That's going to be October 14 from 8 a.m. to noon. Uh, they wanted me to make sure about this, that it's, it's a mandatory in-person attendance. So I know that there might be some people that may not be able to come. Um, if the chairs or the data reps are not uh, able to come to the planning session, we at least want to make sure that every committee has at least two people represented in person at this meeting, if not three, uh, to come from that. So if vice chairs, chairs, or the data person is not able to come to this meeting, it would be good for each committee to go ahead and designate two to three people uh, that will be there in person <clears throat> for the meeting. Even if somebody's going to be on the call, that's perfectly fine. We just want to make sure that we have somebody in person to see what's actually going on and that we're taking care of that piece. Um, one more, also, uh, one more thing that we want to talk about uh, is draft, the draft format itself. Uh, and for the draft format, uh, I think we all still have the uh, the uh, the sample template uh, that Dia has created as far as the problem and goal statement. Um, as far as for the recommendations from 10-9, they don't necessarily have to be in that format, uh, but we do want to make sure that by the time um, <clears throat> that we get to the final piece of the for, uh, of the uh, recommendations that they are in that format. So uh, basically, what we're saying is they can either start that way on ten nine and go ahead and have them in the in the um, in the problem and goal statement format, um, or by the end um, it, it will be done in either case because we want to make sure that we're staying within our process. And of course, that uh, data for, that statement uh, template is the problem statement, the goal statement, uh, indicators, performance measures, as well as the recommendations. Um, I'm trying to make sure I have everything uh, said. Um, yes, just, just make sure that we do have the drafts by at least 10-9. Uh, again, it's very important, especially with, with the, uh, the process of the new police chief uh, coming on. Uh, and the only other thing I think I have is that after 10-4, it's not really uh, useful or engaging. Uh, it's not really useful to have any more conversation uh, after that point of as far as with recommendations, if we haven't already turned in the draft performance uh, of the of those recommendations from the beginning. So we want to make sure that we have all those things in line uh, to really engage the conversation. And then, of course, for that 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 uh, that half day of 1014, uh, those can be used uh, for that purpose. And I think uh, that half day will really be helpful for that. Uh, and we just want to make sure that we're getting straight into the uh, uh, iron and out of what those recommendations may look like. Uh, if anybody has any questions for me right now, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Let's pause here for um, just questions here while we have everyone on the line. And then we will, of course, come back to this as, and um, discuss the details of the template everyone got this week. Any questions from uh, members here? Yes, Vice Chair. I think you're on mute. <laughs> Yes, I was in the wrong space. I just want to confirm that the time that you said that was mandatory is that half day working session on October 14th. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Just want to make sure I had the right date. I was going to make it. Absolutely. Confused. No problem. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions here? Thanks, everybody. Okay. Looks great. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Appreciate it. Mr. Butt, anything else on uh, your end there? Uh, no, Madam Chairman. I'm good. Just working on IT, trying to get Council Member Pulley on here. 
Thank you. We appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not succeeding, unfortunately, but I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> right. Thank you for what you're doing behind the, the, the uh, scenes here. We appreciate it. We're going to uh, continue forward. I just want to briefly walk everyone through our, our um, agenda for today. Uh, we are very much um, excited and excited to welcome uh, Angie Miller, Ms. Miller, a Nashville resident, first to uh, speak with us here, a lived experience guest, followed by Amanda Brock, uh, who is Senior VP for Mental Health, uh, the Mental Health Cooperative. And then uh, last but certainly not least, Dr. Mark Chairs, uh, Assistant Professor of Criminal Justice at Tennessee State University and Executive Fellow uh, at the National Police Foundation. And I believe also Dr. Chairs was shared with us, but he is a former Chief of Police at uh, Schenectady, uh, New York, I believe. And so we will go through and order appropriately that way, of course, leaving out um, 10 to 15 minutes of time within each space for a question and answer uh, and end our conversation and meeting today with just a quick review if there's anything that Ms. Bilal would like to share from this week's data committee meeting. And then, of course, our member assignments and preparing us for next week. I want to thank everyone again just for the diligence and the hard work of everyone meeting in between the meetings with their subcommittees. It really does show, again, uh, the hard work and dedication here that Mr. Lewis just highlighted, but I greatly appreciate it as well. Um, and welcome to everyone as well. We didn't go through the names today, but I certainly see everyone. I know Dr. Jackson and Mr. Shirell are unable to join us, uh, but we certainly have the bounty of everyone here. And Mr. Pulley will be with us soon. With that, I want to extend the floor to Ms. Lucas, who will um, briefly introduce Ms. Miller. Yes. Um, is Wesley still with us? I am. Yes. Could you just confirm for me that um, Andrea is Ms. Miller? I believe that's her. I just yeah, want to make sure. Okay, hi there. Um, I'd like to introduce Angie. She is a Nashville resident. She has been so kind as to offer her time uh, to share her experience with us at NOAA. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with NOAA, NOAA is National Organized for Action and Hope, and we have been working on issues of police reform for several years now. Um, Back in 2011, she had an experience with um, the Metro Nashville Police Department around a traffic stop that she is going to share about for about five minutes, and then we'll um, answer questions if the committee has any. Um, her charges were dismissed, and uh, much to her credit, and I admire her greatly for it, she didn't let the um, situation end there. She stood up for herself and filed a civil rights complaint. And um, I just want to welcome her and thank her so much for her time and her willingness to share her experience with the committee. And I will let you go, Angie. Okay. Um, um, well, basically that night I was coming home from work. It was probably around 11 or so uh, that same week that I was stopped, there was a shooting. So they had an officer on the street, um, just basically, you know, just looking out for anything suspicious, I assume. Um, well, when I get to my street, uh, I see the officer, he's pulling out cause I was, I lived in a cul-de-sac at that time. So I have on my blinker, you know, make sure I'm signaling and doing everything I'm supposed to do. And as soon as I turn, uh, and I'm probably maybe, maybe 200 feet from the stop sign where he was. He, I see him make a U-turn and he cuts on his lights. So in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'm, I haven't done anything wrong. So I feel safer if I just pull into my driveway, which was probably another 500 feet from the point of him being behind me. And I knew that he was actually like stopping me. Um, Basically, it was a traumatizing situation. I mean, uh, just from how he approached me and he just, he said that I was trying to run. So at that point in my mind, I'm upset, you know, cause I'm like, I can't believe this is happening to me right now. You know, I can't even come home. Um, when he arrested me, uh, there, he's had another unit come and search my vehicle. My father was here. so. 
like the whole situation was embarrassing and traumatizing. Um, and this has been like seven years, you know, it's a long time and it's still like me to talk about it. It upsets me because a lot of people of color like myself who were innocent, like fell victim to the system. Um, like that night, like he took my power. I felt like I couldn't do anything. I was afraid, you know, because I was arrested for basically being black, you know, at the end of the day. Um, but looking at it from like, looking back at it, like the experience was very eliminated because it clarified a lot of things for me. You know, a lot of things that a person like me, cause I, I'm, I'm not a person who's in the street or who gets arrested. Like that's not me of people who actually get fall victim to the system and why they continue to reoffend, you know? It's kind of like, I feel like, you know, being with that cop and what he did, just him as a person, I don't think all police are bad. I don't think that, I just think that there are some bad people in uniforms that shouldn't be. Um, but ultimately I feel like the, it's the justice system because I was treated like a criminal and I wasn't, I was innocent and I had, I was treated as such. And that was probably the hardest part. And it's still hard for me to deal with today because I should have never had to go through that, you know, really based on his story, and his report, he, he said it almost hit two people, but there weren't two witnesses. So I had to go to court. Like I was in and out of court. There were times I went to court and they didn't even see my case. So it stretched it out even further, making it more stressful on me. It was a lot of mental anguish um, mm -hmm. during that time. I'm just glad that I didn't give up. I just feel like, I don't know what made me, I guess, cause I have faith in my God that I know eventually, you know, something good was gonna come of it, but like that was very hard and trying for me. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angie. We cannot tell you how much we appreciate um, the courage it takes to come and tell this story. And I want the committee to know that I spoke with Angie and made sure that she felt up to this tonight um, because we know how difficult it is. Um, and you didn't deserve that. Uh, and that's what this commission takes this work very seriously is that we want to um, make those changes that are necessary to make sure that people like yourself never have to go through something like that. Uh, and for people to understand the impact that it has on people to have things like that happen in their lives, it can be devastating, um, not just emotionally, but financially and um, yeah, in a variety of ways. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask Angie um, about her experience or anything that you think would be helpful uh, to know from her um, as we do this work together. She, Mr. Matthews. Oh, sorry. Oh, you got Matthews? it. Uh, yes, thank you for the opportunity to, to ask Angie a question. And Angie, thank you for the story. As, uh, as Ms. Lucas j just said, that, that is a uh, very powerful for you to be able to come and express yourself and be vulnerable uh, to our committee uh, and share that. What, um, I do have a quick question for you. What do you think that the officer could have done differently to avoid the trauma that you've experienced in that situation? What could he have asked? What, what, what differently could have been during that interaction that could have produced a better outcome? People have bad days, I get it. Maybe he didn't want to be there and it was just him externally, like putting on me, whatever it was going on with him internally. I feel like anyone else, you know, I've never been stopped like that. Like I've been, I, I've spit, okay? I've never had an officer <laughs> like approach me like that. So 
I just feel like, I mean, based on what that person is going on psychologically, you don't know how they're going to react to the person they come in contact with, especially if they're not really fond of people of color or maybe some someone of color did something to him and then he just kind of, you know, went for me, even though I'm innocent, but it might have made him feel better, you know. But I just feel like the only way to fix that issue is as far as, like, the justice system. I mean, that's where, like, their bottom line, that's where they're trained through. And what they see is a lot of black faces getting arrested. So it's almost like they're trained to look at us even when we're not, you know, doing crimes. We're looked, we're victimized in that sense because you have, there's different ways of how you know, if someone white was to sell drugs, they might not get the same charges as a black person, you know? But I just feel like how the justice system is, that's what affects us the most. I just feel like if everything was equal across the board, maybe that officer wouldn't have treated me like that because he knew that in the court of law that it's a possibility that like, I'm not gonna be arrested or something like to that effect. Thank you for that answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Matthews. Does anybody else have a question that they would like to ask Angie? Yes, or Mr. Robinson, please go ahead. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Angie, did you get the support you felt you, you needed during the, the, I guess, were you ultimately charged, and maybe I just didn't hear you, hear it, um, I was just curious if you got the support in the legal system um, other than the, uh, any type of civil suit. I, I was wondering what kind of support you got through the legal system. Okay, so I was, first it was, I don't remember like the initial charge what court but it ended up going to a different court because i ended up ultimately hired having three attorneys the first one i hired and he basically told me he was like they're not going to dismiss your case like i know you're innocent but they're not and that was money i had to spend so when i went to court the next time when they sent my case up to criminal court uh, I asked for a court a court appointed attorney and he he was racist like <laughs> he he wanted me to fail and so I had to go back to the judge judge's secretary and ask for another attorney and that's when I met Cal because at that point that's he was working for the state so like I did not like if it wasn't for Cal like I don't know where I would be I would he was like a godsend if I didn't meet that man so I, I'm so grateful that he was there at the right time because I was almost like ready to give up, especially, you know, after hearing from the first attorney that they're not going to dismiss your case, even though I know you're innocent. So. And I think Angie, and I think Angie ran into what a lot of um, people that are charged and they are overwhelmed. Your district attorney's office is 99.9% .9 of the time always going to stand behind the police officer. Um, and you have, um, you're, you feel presumed guilty until you pro prove yourself innocent. And uh, it really bothers me. Uh, that Angie had to go through that also. Um, Angie, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I too appreciate, like Lonel said, you're being vulnerable with us, uh, but uh, that's what we need to hear also to understand what's going on. So thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Well, Angie, thank you again so much from this uh, committee for agreeing to come and to speak 
uh, about what happened to you and for helping people understand the real human toll that these uh, issues can take. And just from my time with you, I, I, I know that you're a very fair-minded person and um, that, that this is not a situation of harboring a grudge or a resentment, but, um, and it took a lot of courage for you, even after your charges were dismissed, even after um, actually the officer was shown to have made false statements about what happened, um, to stand up for yourself like that um, took a lot of courage and it took a lot of courage to come here tonight. So we thank you so much for your time and we're gonna let you go. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. I'll turn it back over to you, Peter Davis. Uh, actually, Vice Chair Lucas, if you'd like, I, you did the wonderful work of connecting us with Ms. Brock. Feel free to extend it to her as well. I'd be happy to. I've known Ms. Brock for a very long time. We used to uh, work together when she was working with the um, Guardian Ad Litem's office, and I was a caseworker at juvenile court. Amanda is the Senior Vice President for Clinical Services for the Mental Health Cooperative. She has been exceedingly generous with her time with this commission. I think she probably feels like she's a member. She's been to so many of our meetings um, and has presented already on a variety of topics. I've been to one of her brown bag lunches. Um, we've asked her here today, um, I believe you all may recall, um, when Dr. Peter Valier did his presentation, he um, spoke about the different models that exist for uh, community members um, either working independently of or in concert with um, Metro Nashville Police Department, uh, how to respond to mental health crises. You know, just using this as a wonderful opportunity to reimagine how those calls may go. So we have asked um, Ms. Brock to come and speak to us about, first of all, what is the current um, collaboration between the Mental Health Co-op and the Metro Nashville Police Department on calls involving mental health crises? And then what sorts of models um, the co-op and Ms. Brock is such a wealth of information on this topic, just what she sees as areas of collaboration, either um, further areas to expand our, their collaboration with um, the department or other models such as the CAHOOTS model and more community-based programs. And so we just asked her to join us and to share her wisdom with us. Thank you so much for joining us again with your time. Uh, you have been so kind. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity. So I'm, I'm willing to devote my time because it's something I'm passionate about. Uh, as Amanda said, I've, I've worked in the field of mental health and criminal justice in Nashville for, well, over 20 years now, so I'm dating myself. Um, if I, I have a PowerPoint, can I be... Uh, uh, the presenter so I could show that or share my screen. Oh, here we go. Let's see, pull up. Can y'all see my screen? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Let me know if... Still waiting? Yeah, but uh, Amanda, let me know if you can see it on your end, but I, I, it hasn't shown up on mine. Did, uh, Wesley, did, did we give uh, permission to Ms. Brock? Yeah. Ms. Brock, does it say you have the permission to share there? It doesn't. The share button is grayed out on the bottom of my screen. Okay, one second. Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, do we think um, can we grant that access to Ms. Brock? Please. Yeah, so Mr. Button, are you a uh, co-host as well? Are you able to extend that to Ms. Uh, Brock? Alas, I do not have that power. You don't know this? Okay. Brown, I'm assuming- But I bet Wesley will return momentarily. Okay. No problem here. Well, well, if you want, while we wait on him, I can I can kind of talk y'all through what's on the slides if you'd like me to go ahead. 
And I will uh, email Mr. Smith here. I think I have his email. Uh, John, would you mind doing that too? Just maybe to catch his attention. Absolutely, I will do so. I'm sorry about that, Ms. Rock. I'll we'll, 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 uh, interrupt you right away to let you know we've done. Okay, great. So uh, for those of you who are not aware of what uh, of mental health crisis services in Nashville, let me give you just a really quick overview. Um, so the Mental Health Cooperative, we're a non-for-profit mental health agency, and we started in 1993 in Nashville. Um, and in 1993, we were awarded the crisis contract for Davidson County. And what that means is that the Commissioner of Mental Health designated us as the mobile crisis responder for the Davidson County area. And over the years, that service has expanded to not just be mobile crisis, uh, where people, where we send master's level counselors out into the community or to hospital emergency rooms to do psychiatric consults, but it's also evolved to having a 24-7 crisis walk-in center, uh, which is now known as our crisis treatment center. It's located in Metro, in, uh, Metro Center. We also have a 15-bed crisis stabilization unit, which is a voluntary unit for people who need a high level of psychiatric intervention, but they have the ability to consent to treatment. They know they need that treatment, um, and therefore it's, a, it's uh, able to provide rapid, comprehensive services to prevent an unnecessary hospitalization. Because in, in reality, and in in currently in our state of mental health, if you need inpatient psychiatric treatment and uh, you have no insurance, the only way I can get that for you is to involuntarily commit you to a state hospital, which is taking your rights away. And the crisis stabilization unit and the other services we offer, we offer them regardless of somebody's insurance and we do everything we can not to, to take their rights away, particularly if they want the treatment. So it's really critical that that crisis stabilization unit is there to provide that level of care. The um, other thing we have is an eight bed, what we call respite or intensive intervention center. It's for less acute crises, um, but again, it's an, it's an opportunity for people who need psychiatric care, but they don't need hospital level of care. So that's kind of who we are. And over the years, we have, um, no, uh, we have developed partnership with Metro Police out of, um, A, out of just a sheer necessity because often when somebody is in a psychiatric crisis, the first call is to 911. And when that call happens, you can either be dispatched to an ambulance can be the, the first responder or it's law enforcement. And all too often it's law enforcement. And uh, starting in around 2000, 1999 to 2000, um, the Mental Health Co-op and Metro started talking and saying, whoa, wait a minute, we need to partner and we need to have good open lines of communication because our officers are often getting called to, to do these assessments, or not to do these assessments, but to respond, and they don't know what to do. And we're like, great, you need to call us. Let officers do what they do best, which is Trail the streets and safety, that's what they should do. Let us handle the mental health piece. Um, now, over the years, that partnership has expanded, and it's, I'll be the first to say it's not perfect. Um, it's not a perfect uh, system. Because when an officer arrives, if they don't readily recognize that that person has a mental health issue, then their option is if they're causing a disturbance, they think that they are um, meeting the criteria for uh, an offense, they're going to take them to jail. Um, if the officer, hopefully, if the officer is properly trained and has proper information and recognizes that their mental health, there's a mental health issue, then our work with them says there's another option. You do not have to take that person to jail for, let's say, criminal trespass or disorderly conduct. You call us. You call mental health. You can either have us respond to the scene or you can bring them to that 24-7 walk-in center that we have. So that's what we've spent many, many years working on on that piece. And um, hopefully I'll be able to show you all a slide and um, before I finish that we'll show you some of the data that we have. You now have uh, presenter uh, capabilities. Oh, Thank great. You. Sorry about that. Thanks. Do I need to do anything to or just click on? I believe you should be able to click the share button. Mr. Smith has set you up so you, um, Wesley set you up so you can simply hit share, I believe, and it'll right. give you credit. Okay. Yeah. Are y'all seeing yeah. it now? 
We can. Awesome. Okay. There you go. Just, um, this is just some pictures of those services I was telling you about. That's the crisis treatment center where people can walk in and they can stay overnight for 23 hour treatment and observation. Uh, the next one here, that's the crisis stabilization unit. That's kind of the one, the step below you get to hospitalization. Um, it's kind of how we describe it. We can treat people who are actively suicidal, actively psychotic. Um, it's got round the clock staffing, including 24-7 uh, nursing staffing and daily psychiatric care. And this was what I was describing, um, trying my best to describe. So when a person's in crisis, there's usually three main entry points uh, or three systems that are accessed. It can either be EMS, if EMS gets the call, emergency room, then the hospitalization sometimes, or they're routed back to the crisis team or law enforcement's called, they could call the crisis team, or they could, if the person's presenting with behavior that would lead to arrest, they can arrest them. Or they could, again, round to what we want to do in, in, with partnerships and continued work on improving the system is to have that one point be, person has a psychiatric crisis, get them to the place that can do psychiatric, psychiatric treatment. Our emergency rooms are great, but they're not designed to be psychiatric treatment facilities. Law enforcement, they don't want to be mental health clinicians. That's not why they got into law enforcement. So they need to be able to hand off to us. And we certainly don't want to see people who are mentally ill in jail if it's a manifestation of their mental illness um, versus a criminal intent. Hey, Amanda. Yes. I'm sorry to jump in here. Um, we're seeing your title card, but your slides are not advancing. Ah, sorry about that. No worries. And my apologies to everybody about the technical issues tonight. Um, but we're going to get it working. Well, um, hold on just a second for me and I will see if I can make this. Take your time. All right. Well, I apologize because on my screen, I am seeing it advance. <laughs> Ms. Brock, could be possible we have Mr. Smith here. Wesley might be able to help, but if you could Sorry, even. Ashley, I think you're on mute if you're trying to. Oh, can you still not hear me? Can you hear me now? Y'all see we can hear you, Ashley. You're good. Okay, I was just going to offer the option of perhaps if you would be. I Ms. Brock, I don't want to have to point in between screens, but if you're able to email it to Ms. Lucas, we can send it out to the entire committee very quickly and they can follow along that way too. Hello? Can y'all hear me now? Okay. I'm so sorry and I don't know why my... My slides are advancing, but no problem at all. Okay. Well, I will continue talking and I will send y'all the slide deck afterwards. How about that? Okay. That'd be great. Okay. So, um, what we do currently with Metro PD is um, we're trying to overcome challenges and one of the big challenges had been several a couple of years ago is that if officers did call us or bring somebody to us if the person was highly agitated we had no safe place to resume resume care for that person we didn't have the the staffing nor the physical layout where we could say officer thank you for bringing this person here you may leave and that was leading to officers spending somewhere around 98, on average, 98 minutes if they brought somebody to our walk-in center, um, which is uh, a big problem. So we were able to get some funding, build a new, uh, our facility, our crisis treatment center, so that we can release officers now. When they bring somebody to us, we get them out of the door, out uh, within 10 minutes. So in under 10 minutes, officer brings them in, gives report to clinical staff and clinical staff take over and we release the officer. Um, that has taken us many years to get there. Um, we want mental, the mental health clinicians to be part of providing care for that person, not the officer. 
So um, the as part of that piece, um, we also have had to revamp how we train law enforcement. And our agency, the Mental Health Cooperative, has been part of training law enforcement for um, well over 15 years now. But in the last few years, I would say the last five years, we've really advanced what we've done in regards to that training. Um, it now consists of, we do 12 hours of classroom, just basic here's what mental health is, here's what mental illness is, here's signs and symptoms and suicide prevention at the academy. But beyond, but after the classroom training, we do real life scenario based training. So we do, we have various um, scenarios that we go through with the officers where they then have to act like they are responding to that person who has a mental illness or is having a psychiatric crisis. Um, then we don't leave it there. We do true uh, outside kind of a combination of the officers doing their tactical training as well as mental health training, where we work with the training officers at the academy. We have these very in-depth scenarios where the cadets are graded on how they use the verbal de-escalation that we taught them in the classroom out in a field-based type scenario. Um, they, they're uh, the trainers from the academy, the police officer trainers, will grade them on kind of their tactical approaches. Mental health professionals from my office are there to provide feedback to them about how they're doing on their verbal de-escalation. And it's our mental health clinicians who are acting as the person who's in crisis. Um, so that addition to that, to that piece of the training, and it's all day, it's eight hours, we're out there, uh, our, my team's out there training, it's really intense and we do debriefings afterwards to say, this is what worked, this is what didn't work, this is where you did well, this is where you, you should have done this versus that. Um, I think that's been a, a huge enhancement there and I've been very pleased with Metro's responsiveness to that piece of, of our training. And then it doesn't stop there. We do two hours of in-service with uh, all the veteran officers each year. And the topics vary. It's, it's always a mental health related topic. And we usually uh, meet with the training staff uh, several months ahead of time and talk about what they think the needs are. We give feedback from what our staff is seeing in terms of our interaction. Um, for instance, last year, we focused on trauma-informed care. What is trauma-informed care? Um, how do you... Um, have a trauma-informed approach. Um, and so we're currently working on what that's going to be for the next year. Um, all of those things, like I said, have just enhanced in the last several years. The one thing that I will say I would like to see happen more, um, now that we've done the training, we have the crisis treatment center where we can take handoffs from the police, is our number of what we call police-initiated calls going up. That's the slide I wished I could show you, but I'll send it in the slide deck. Um, police initiated calls are just basically what it says. The police were the first responders and they are the ones who call us for assistance. And with, since fiscal year 17, uh, for that year, we had a little under a thousand of those calls. Now with fiscal year 20, we're just barely over a thousand of those calls where overall crisis team, we see well over 8,000 in a year. Um, so I just, I think there's more opportunity, whether it's um, helping the officers better identify when they're interacting with somebody who's mentally ill and saying, well, wait a minute, instead of taking that person down for, you know, that minor misdemeanor offense, let's take them over to the crisis team. Um, the other thing that we are starting to do, but I think needs to happen on a more formal basis is case reviews. So one of the other areas of my responsibility outside of the mobile crisis piece is I oversee our mental health clinicians at the Davidson County Sheriff's Office. So the mental health co-op is the provider of mental health services at the Sheriff's Office. So sometimes my team there will say, hey, we got this person who was arrested last night and in looking at their charges and looking at their mental illness, we're just scratching our head as to why they were arrested versus going to the crisis center. So I've worked on several committees with Deputy Chief Huggins with Metro PD. I get on the phone with him and I say, look, Damien, we got a problem here. Take a look at this case. You know, why, why was this person brought to jail versus coming to us? That's just on a kind of an ad hoc 
way, it needs to be more formalized. And I think if we had a true, whether it's CIT or a co-response or a CAHOOTS model of care, that type of formal process would be in place to review cases and to have metrics to say this is working or this isn't working or this sector seems to have more of these incidents where people who could have been diverted by the officer weren't diverted. Um, I have a, a map that shows this by sector where we're seeing most of the crisis calls um, in the city. And South sector has the most with, um, from September of 19 to September of 2020, 133 calls where officers identified and brought them to us. Um, North, uh, or actually Central is a close second with 115 and North is 110. Um, I think that, again, looking at those patterns can tell us where we might need to focus some of our efforts at different sectors. And one of the things we did in the last um, last year and a half is I de dedicated one of my staff positions at the mental health co-op for a, a police liaison where uh, it's a master's level clinician who he does a lot of the police training, but he also is the point person for going to roll calls and um, informing officers of that, like, here's here's how you get in touch with us. If you have a problem here, I'm your go to. He also does a lot of co-response on some of the SWAT standoffs that occur in our city. And I will say that the SWAT team, the, the hostage negotiating team of the SWAT force with Metro has, has been, in my opinion, by far the most receptive to enhancing their mental health training. Uh, two years ago, they asked us to develop a CIT-like training for them, 40 hours. They pulled in all of their negotiators and we, we brought in um, speakers and trainers from a variety of, of different agencies around town and put them through a 40 hour, just like CIT would. Um, and they have utilized that training time and time again. And, and they, nine times out of 10, if they're on a standoff, even if they don't know if the person's mentally ill or not, they're calling us and so that we can have a responder there. The advantage of that is we can look at information in our system to let us know if we've ever seen that person before and gather mental health information, or we can often be talking to the support system of that person who's in that barricade situation to gather information about the mental health issue, give that to the negotiator to try to end those situations peacefully. Um, so the, the last thing I know, um, Y'all wanted to kind of hear about the different models. I know y'all had some uh, presentations before about the different models that are out there. The three that I'm most familiar with in looking at what happens across the country is a co-response model between mental health clinicians and law enforcement. The crisis intervention team model, also known as the MIPIS model, which is uh, probably the most well-known model between officers to, do, to be that first response. And then last, of course, is the CAHOOTS model or crisis assisting helping out on the streets, which is one of the more newer models that's out there that really that the first responder is not a police officer. It's usually a mental health clinician or a peer support. And that trigger for that person to go out from a CAHOOTS model is you have to need, you really need somebody added with dispatch so that you can pick up on those calls before they get out to the police officer. Um, I think all my, all three of those models have a lot of validity, and I think that there's pros and cons with all of them. But as we look for what's appropriate for Nashville, I think a few things we have to consider. Um, what is in place in our community, and how will either any of those models enhance or improve existing services? How are we going to? How will the model be funded and sustained? Um, Obviously, we, we could create a great model, but if we can't keep it sustained, it's just, it, it's, we're going to fail, and we you know we deserve better. We need our community needs better. It also you need we need to look at what agencies and systems need to be actively involved and in agreement about the model that's going to to, to come into play, and that's that's critical because one thing I've learned in 20 years of doing crisis work that you can have the best crisis assessment or intervention team out there. But if they don't have good, solid resources to refer that person to post-crisis, you're just going to see that person time and time again. 
Um, and the follow-up service is available for that post-crisis intervention. Again, I just can't say enough about whatever model is chosen, you have to have that in play. Um, I will, I, whether you want to know or not, I'll tell you right now, I think a co-response model um, in Nashville is something we could get off the ground a lot quicker than um, some of the other models that are out there. Um, but that doesn't mean that's always the way to go. That's that's something that we have, we're starting to do on a more global basis with Metro PD. Um, and recently I had a, a meeting with them where they are very invested in looking at a co-response model where they would, uh, where we would dispatch a plainclothes police officer who wants to do mental health, that's the other key piece, along with the mental health clinician on calls related to, um, to mental illness and anybody who's in a psychiatric crisis. And I've seen that co-response model. I've been out on those calls myself and I've worked really well. Um, the key is having officers there who understand mental health, who want to be a, a good partner and um, who let the mental health clinician take the lead in that scenario. So that's all I had. Um, any questions? And again, I'm sorry, I couldn't pull up PowerPoint and technical difficulties. Please do not apologize. Thank you so much for joining us. If you just wanna email me, I will make sure that that gets out. Um, to everybody. I just want to make sure that everybody on our team understands um, what these things mean. So I just want to review really quickly. The CIT stands for crisis intervention. And you may have remembered from our trip to the academy. It's, uh, um, again, as uh, Ms. Brock pointed out, it's for, you know, officers who are interested in that um, keep mental health piece where they get the training um, on the front end and then they do in services. Uh, the co-response model, which is an officer, which plain clothes is a great idea, um, and a mental health, uh, mental health clinician. And then the cahoots model, which would be just a clinician or a um, peer support from the community. Um, I had a question for Ms. Brock, I know that there was a situation, I've heard a lot of very good things about the SWAT team, um, and I know people work very hard, but there was a situation recently um, that your team, I think, was involved in with somebody threatening to hang themselves in a tree, was that correct? That's correct, yes. And um, the SWAT team was deployed to that. Um, and my question, as somebody um, who is, I, I've never been aware of the SWAT team responding to a suicide, um, if you feel that, you know, when I picture SWAT team, I <laughs> picture them in, you know, tactical their field team yeah. six, tactical gear. When you have a suicidal person who, who's not breaking any laws, uh, it sounds like they handled it beautifully. That's not my question. Um, but my question is, do you feel like um, that was the appropriate team to have responded to that call? You know, not knowing what led up to that particular call, I, I can't say for sure about this situation. But what I can tell you is that I, I think we probably do ourselves a disservice when we talk about SWAT that way. It's really their negotiator team. Um, oh, okay. Some of the calls I've been on, the negotiator team is part of the SWAT team. Um, and so they, as, as their name says, they're doing that negotiation piece. From my understanding and how it's working now, and it's evolved over the years, is if there's a situation where a patrol officer feels like they can't talk a person down, they have that as a resource to call the SWAT team. And the, the negotiators, when I've been out there, they don't immediately, unless there's a, a firearm involved and a barricade with a, you know, somebody who's, they're holding hostage, they come in very in, without all their tactical stuff and start talking to the individual. Um, and they are really um, some of the some of the best in terms of de-escalating that I've, I've, I've seen. So it's it, the name and how it's done is a little bit of a mis, you know, it, it kind of portrays it from a different light. Now, that's not to say there aren't times when the full tactical team's out there and the bus is out there and the negotiator's talking via somebody on the phone, but that's usually when there's a person with a gun 
possible hostage, that type of scenario. Gotcha. That's very, say, very helpful. Thank you for yeah, sharing that detail. And one thing I'll say is as somebody who, you know, is supervising a team of roughly 30 clinicians who um, I've seen this change over the years. It used to be we would go to the community, like on that particular scenario, if we got the call from a bystander saying, hey, so-and-so is on the bridge threatening to jump, well, we're not going to be able to do restraint on the bridge. So we may ask mm -hmm. officers to meet us there. Sure. But we would go. We would immediately go. Um, in the last few years, we've seen a change in a lot of the calls we're getting where the potential for violence, and I, I don't know why, I think a lot of it has to do with the drug issue in our city. About 80% of the people we are seeing have some sort of serious co-occurring substance abuse issue along with their psychiatric issue. And that has been leading to a lot of more volatile or potentially volatile situations. So I will say from a mental health clinician standpoint, there's been, there's a, I've seen in my team a lot more reluctance to go out without law enforcement meeting them there because of some of the stuff we've seen related to drug use. Um, again, I, I don't want to, and as a mental health advocate, do not want to get the message out there that mentally ill people are violent. It's not that. It's that when right. you add substances in the mix, often family, domestic type situations are going on as a result, it escalates that danger factor. And uh, mental health clinicians are, are very leery about going on community calls totally by themselves. Understandable. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for Ms. Brock? Anyone wanna ask her anything about the response to mental health crisis calls? the current collaboration with MNPD or a future collaboration, expanding collaboration, if you will. I had a quick question. What communities do we know that use the CAHOOTS model? I know um, Oregon, um, I believe Washington State. Um, I wanna say there may be a, a New Mexico maybe. Um, they're all, at, most of them that I'm familiar with are out west. Um, and they are, they just coincidentally also happen to be states that expanded Medicaid, which is a whole other issue that they lead to, they have more robust access to services for people who fall through the gap, uh, where they would fall through the gap in Tennessee since we're not a Medicaid expansion state. They would have coverage for those follow-up services is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I know. I think that's something that we're falling prey to here in getting to use maybe services that we want because we don't have that expansion. And um, in that model, which probably would be one that we couldn't do anyway, I'm just curious um, the role of a peer, what their training would be. Like, is that, I don't know, just the word yeah. peer could mean a lot of things. Absolutely, and I think it means a lot of different things. I, to be perfectly honest, I want to know more about how the cahoots, the teams that are doing the cahoots model out west, how they train peers. I can tell you, for Tennessee, there is a certified peer uh, recovery training. The Department of Mental Health does that training, so that that um, somebody with lived experience with mental health and/or an addiction can go through the training and be a certified peer recovery specialist. Um, I will say we we actually uh, my agency we employ a few peer uh, specialists and and they do some really great work and how they can connect with people, but it has been very hard for many of them to work in a crisis environment. Um, it often triggers some of their own trauma with what they see, um, and so we have to. It's very difficult to find that special peer that has been um, well enough in their own recovery and has a really good support system behind them to do crisis work um, because it's just so intense. Thank you so much, Ms. Bilal. Does anybody else have any questions for Ms. Brock? Oh, sorry. Uh, Rachel, was it you? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't tell if I was muted or not. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Brock. It's great to hear from you. I know that you all have done amazing work over the years and the creation of the 24-7 clinic has been so good for our community. I'm wondering if 
what you would like, how can we best support you as we look to put forth recommendations next week? How can we best support the co-op um, uh, in the relationship with law enforcement? Thank you for that question. That's a really good question. I, what I would like to see as we look for the next leadership within the police department and, and going forward is a commitment to doing a, a formal model, whether that is a co-response model or CIT or whatever that fits to that. And one of the things they've done, the Metro Police have done over the years, and, and I will agree with that, they, they train all of their officers on various aspects that would be part of CIT training. But what's missing, and what I explained to, to Interim Chief, Chief Drake this week, was that you need officers who want to be that first responder. If you're, if the police are, if you're going to go one of the models that the police are the first to be at, and I think that's what they're missing when they say they train everybody. Well, it's great that you train everybody, but we need to have a specialized unit, just like there's a specialized unit for, for sex crimes, which is a very difficult thing to do, and a specialized unit for, you know, drug use. We need to have a specialized unit for mental health crises, um, and and policies to look at what outcomes do we want from that unit. We should be seeing then the number of mentally ill people being arrested for misdemeanor offenses, in my opinion, go down if we have that specialized unit who works hand in hand with us. So that's a long way of saying just a commitment that they will um, look at solid mental health programs and will commit to a specialized mental health response team, however that looks. Thank you. That's perfect. Thanks. Thank you for that question, Ms. Freeman. Does anybody else have a question for Ms. Brock? I do, Amanda, please. Yeah, please. Uh, Ms. Brock, uh, where does, and if I, I might have missed it, but where does the funding for mobile crisis and the mobile health co-op come from? Great question. Um, I did not mention that. So we get part of our funding from the Department of Mental Health. It is flat grant funding to do mobile crisis services, the walk-in center, the crisis stabilization unit. And um, it's just a flat grant amount, whether we treat 300 um, indigent people a month versus 3,000 indigent people a month. The other uh, part of our funding is from if an individual has 10 care and we admit them into either our crisis stabilization unit or crisis treatment center, we can build 10 care for that admission. Um, and then we get $400,000 from the city of Nashville. That's relatively new. That's just been with the last three years um, to add more staff to take some of that burden off the police sitting in our, our lobby. It, it, that pays for increased nursing staff and what we call psychiatric techs who are those ones that help us keep our units safe. Um, so those are the three main areas where we get our funding from. Is there a chance with whether the mayor's proposed um, property tax increase, will, will that, does that anticipate keeping the Metro's level of support to your office or are you looking at a some kind of budget um, de deficit created by not getting the money Good question. we we don't know to be perfectly honest our funding flows through the health department and i've been told that that four hundred thousand that we get is it ho hopefully we'll continue to get that um, but I will say, even with all of that funding, uh, we operate this past fiscal year, we have operated at a $900,000 loss. Um, that We can't sustain that level of loss year over year. So we're doing a lot of efforts to advocate for more funding from the state, from the Department of Mental Health, um, and looking for alternative funding sources um, because our number of indigent, uninsured people who we're treating continues to go up. And um, the, the level of staffing we have to do and the medical staff we have to keep uh, goes up. And I don't know anything about um, medical staffing, you know, nurse, being able to keep nurses in this city when you're competing with HCAs and Vanderbilt's of the world is very, very difficult. And then you add psychiatry on top of that, um, it drives up your operating costs. Okay. And in 
I know that just from reading that police departments across the country have shifted their model a little bit of using, I guess, law enforcement officers for certain specific tasks, like um, I guess some of the crime scene people now, they, they are not necessarily they don't have a gun and a badge they're more of a civilian employee and i i, I guess their the training for them is substantially cheaper and maybe uh chief drake would consider trying to employ or work some civilian employees that could work but closer with your uh office and what you all do because it's <clears throat> so important and um, it just seems there's uh, got to be a way for us to try to figure this out, even if we have to uh, call John Bunton all day, every day, and shake some trees <laughs> to see if we can uh, get you some help. Oh, look who appeared. There he is. Um, anyway, uh, Brock, thank, that was just an idea of where I, I've read departments across the country are, are going with civilian employees rather than taking numbers of law enforcement personnel off right. the street uh, and, and throwing them into a whole different career. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Robinson, suddenly Mr. Button appeared. I've been, he I, were I've been here all along, listening attentively. D do you have a question for Ms. Brock or Mr. No, Robinson? No, I do. I appreciate all of, her, all, all of her time. Okay. No, I just saw you unmute. I just wanted to make sure you didn't have any questions. Um, I have a quick question. Um, you, uh, okay, so the co-op oversees the clinicians that work at the DCSO, the Davidson mm -hmm. County Sheriff's Office. And if there is a case where somebody is there, well, first of all, who flags those cases for your clinicians to review? Mm -hmm. And if you could explain to the committee, because I know that this has been some confusion within NOAA, there's the Crisis Treatment Center, which is managed by the co-op out at Metro Center, like you said. And then the jail has its own, I believe it's called the Behavioral? Behavioral Care Center, yeah. Behavioral Care Center, mm -hmm. actually within the jail. Mm -hmm. um, so my questions are number one, who flags those cases for your clinicians to review? Are your clinicians then the ones that recommend the Behavioral Care Center? How, how does that flow chart work? Does sure. that make sense, that question? It it does. So let me take the first question is, so how does that person, how does a person get flagged once they're in the jail or they're on their way to jail? So there's, there's a couple of different ways. So let's say th this happens quite frequently where an officer did get called to a scene. They recognize the person may have a mental illness, but that person has an outstanding warrant. Um, at that point, the officer really has limited discretion as to what they do with that person. Um, they will often call our crisis team and say, hey, just so you know, I'm taking John Doe down to the jail. He had an outstanding warrant, but he also mentioned being suicidal. I'm going to let booking know, but they now know that we have a jail team. So our crisis team will then send an email uh, or a phone call after hours to our jail team over there and say, hey, you need to be able to look out for John Doe. That will immediately flag in their system that John is coming in and he needs to be seen by mental health in the jail. Um, we also have a flagging system in the jail where if that individual, that inmate, has previously been treated by us in the jail, it'll flag when they're rearrested so that we know that. The other way we know is that every day my office, my outpatient office, gets a feed from the Davidson County Sheriff's Office of everybody who's been arrested in the previous previous 24 hours. We compare that with who we have in our electronic health record and pull out those common those common names. And so every morning when my jail clinicians come in, they know these individuals who have a history with mental health co-op were arrested overnight. You need to see them. So that's one big way, and that's been going on for a while. Under the, the sheriff's office and the health department re recently um, signed a new healthcare contract that we are part of as mental health 
it expands some of our, uh, our team at the jail, both for the Behavioral Care Center, which is brand new, and the regular jail. So um, I'm currently working at being mental health clinicians in booking 24-7 which we've never had mental health clinicians actually working in the booking area 24 seven up until now. The individuals who are now being booked in would be screened by medical then seen by mental health. If they have a mental health issue, at that point, the mental health clinician will say, DCSO, this person has a mental health issue. DCSO looks at their charges. If they are a misdemeanor offender, non-DUI, DUI is the only exception, then they could be deemed eligible for the Behavioral Care Center. At that point, um, the very next morning, Monday through Friday, then they are they would be reviewed at like 7 a.m. by the DA, the public defender, and a member of, of my team at Behavioral Care Center would review those cases. And um, if there's no objection, then mental health would meet with the, the individual and say, you know, you meet criteria for this program. As opposed to proceeding with your criminal case, we would like to move you over to the Behavioral Care Center for treatment. If you complete treatment, then the DA is not going to prosecute you on this case. If you don't complete treatment um, or you know you refuse, then you're just going to go through the regular court pathway. That's how the Behavioral Care Center is set up to work. Um, but it's brand new. Um, that process will start October 15th. So um, it's. That's how new the Behavioral Care Center is. So the difference between that and what we do at the Crisis Treatment Center is, for whatever reason, that, that individual was brought down to booking because that officer felt like he or she had no discretion and they had to file a charge against that person. We try to divert them so that they don't get prosecuted on that case if they adhere to treatment. Um, once they complete treatment, the DA has said that they will then go back and, and basically say they're not gonna prosecute that case. So therefore that person does not have that conviction on the record. CTC, our crisis treatment center, what we do at Metro Center is for those cases where the officer truly does have discretion. They don't have to arrest them. They can bring them down to us. Fantastic. Yeah. And I'm trying to be mindful of our time, but does anybody else have any questions uh, for Ms. Brock? I have just one quick question. Um, I kind of got a blade and I didn't hear, you said you had three funding sources, 10 care, 400K from Davidson County. And what was your third source? Did you say state funding? Yeah, the Department of Mental Health. Okay, Department of Mental Health. And the Mental Health Cooperative, is it a 501c3? Yes, yes. Okay, and the peer training that you spoke of that you have, are those paid positions or are they volunteers? They're paid positions. They are a full full time staff member with our agency. Okay. Oh, and have you applied for any federal funding, or do you have a history of having acquired federal funding? You know, we have as an agency the co op. We have a few federal funding sources, but not specifically for our crisis department. And that's that. You know, part the only part of the problem with some of the federal funds that are out there is they're usually short term. They're one and two year contracts, and then you're left with how are you going to sustain it? Um, so, we have not. Do you have a grant writer? We do not. We do not have a full time grant writer. Uh, those federal grants are hard to write. You have to really yeah. almost partner, you know, with the county to Absolutely. do that. I'm just thinking of um, as Mr. Robinson was talking about funding opportunities to pull this together. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bilal. Those are excellent questions, as were all of them. If anybody else has any questions for Ms. Brock, just email me and I will be happy to connect you. Can I ask a quick question? I'm sorry, I had my hand up for a while, but I don't think it was seen on there. Uh, and, it's, and it's in line with what was being asked as Please. well. Yes. Uh, my question is, what is your annual operating budget? You said you're $900,000 in the hole this year. You get 400,000 from the city and you get some money from grants and some from 10 care, but what is your operating budget? For the overall crisis continuum, um, I think it's about 2.3 million. I can email that to, to Ms. Lucas and then she can send that out. Um, I should know that off the top of my head, but I'm not good at retaining figures. Uh, that's fine. I was just wondering, you know, 900 short of what? So that's why we were trying to, I was, or at least in my head, I was trying to do the math. Thank you so sure. much for everything. Really great information. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Delgado, and thank you, Ms. Brock, for your, again, generosity of time with us. Everything that you've offered us has been incredibly helpful. And I can't promise you we're done with you, but <laughs> thank you so much for helping us with our work that this commission's doing. Well, anytime, and thank you all for what y'all are doing. I appreciate it. Sure. And I will toss it back to Ms. Davis. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, Lucas. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Brock. We appreciate you. Very much. I um, next on our agenda is uh, Dr. Mark Chairs. I believe he was having difficulty, or I know rather, he was having difficulty joining uh, the WebEx, which seems to be a pattern for a lot of us today um, with technical issues. And Mr. Smith has been helping behind the scenes. Dr. Chairs, uh, are you on the line with us by chance? Dr. Chairs, if you are, feel free to unmute and join us. What I do believe, I believe he was actually unable, will be unable to join us. We've um, been working behind the scenes, and really the we is uh, Mr. Smith. has been working fervently behind the scenes to get him connected. Um, but we're uh, going to continue to proceed here. I sent an email um, uh, yesterday afternoon to everyone as a bit of a template for what uh, we are all putting together for tomorrow's, uh, right, not tomorrow, it'll seem like tomorrow, though the way time is moving, but next uh, Thursday's meeting. And so we'll take the abundance of that entire time to go through subcommittee by subcommittee to discuss um, the uh, identified uh, opportunities and problems that you have uh, you and your subcommittee uh, have found, but also the three to four recommendations. Um, and I, I'd like for us to try to keep them two, no more than three or four per subcommittee, just because as we bring all of them together, they will uh, become um, quite a bit uh, of a volume. But of the three to four, and let's just say it's four, you, if you notice at the bottom, one of the additional um, components we've added here is a need to discuss uh, and contribute to the culture and relationship with the COB. There is no specific subcommittee for that, but it seems that all of us have been not just asking questions and listening in, but come up with ideas on ways that we can ensure MMPD and COB are working together, sharing information, responsive, and that they serve, uh, of course, they serve the common purpose of engaging and protecting and keeping the voice of the community at hand. And so I'd like for each subcommittee, if you could, please ensure that there's at least one element of your recommendations that thinks about this. And so whether it's um, I'll on my own here with training, and so we've been speaking about uh, basic training and the exposure, our uh, early exposure and education of recruits to have an opportunity to learn more about the COB and build that rapport, or if you're on the space of use of force um, in the disciplinary procedures and, and the great information we have. Um, there is just one more thing I want to share with this um, this space here. Uh, is that, and Mr. Button can correct me if I'm wrong, but we shared, I shared yesterday a few documents from uh, the COB, specifically uh, Dr. Valier and others, of recent recommendations that were shared out. Some of them, many of us have already seen, uh, but it will be posted. Mr. Button, am I right about that? To the SharePoint for everyone to see. Yes, we also I, we also talked about just emailing everyone a direct copy because I think it's especially important. Why don't we just email everyone and put great. it in SharePoint? Okay, perfect. Okay. So if you'll have that. Um, thanks to Mr. Button and the team. Uh, there you'll have that as a reference point as well to consider not just for consent decrees uh, and, and the information we heard from Dr. Valier, but also other components as well. So um, are there any questions about the uh, template that was shared yesterday? Did everyone receive it too? Because I'm also happy to resend. it. I hold my interjection just a moment. Yeah. Um, Mr. Wood? Oh, uh, would you be able to identify yourself? Mr. Smith, are you, uh, are you asking about a, a new joiner? Yeah, there's someone who uh, called in. The person that was the call-in user from four left. There seems to be another one. I was just trying to see if that was Dr. Chairs by any chance. Mm -hmm. um, if they would be able to identify themselves. I believe they might have to identify themselves, though. Um, 
not hearing anything from them. I'll leave them unmuted for the time being. So if they uh, are able to unmute themselves and just identify themselves, uh, you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, just let us know. Not a problem at all. And we can certainly look for future time, Dr. Chairs. We wouldn't want to rush him, but also want to ensure that uh, we connect with them appropriately too. It seems it's not on him. It's just been issues with all of us. It's a Thursday and uh, technology is having a Friday already. So it's okay. Um, so um, I think I saw Mr. Woods, were you about to ask a question or make a statement, Mr. Woods? Mr. Woods, you're muted. Let me try again. Can you hear me now? How about now? Can. Hear? We can. Okay. I'm concerned about the format you sent out and you're saying tonight we want to limit it to three or four recommendations. I mean, uh, you know, the President's Commission on 21st Century Policing, uh, which took thousands of hours of testimony, the very same issues that we're covering every week. Uh, you know, I haven't counted how many recommendations there are, but it's a heck of a lot more than three or four per subcommittee on the issues we've got. How, how are we supposed to, if we've got 10 recommendations, how do we pick three out of the 10 is what I'm asking? No, I think it's a good question, Mr. Woods. And, and look, I, and my, my focus here, and I'm kind of going through all of the notes of my subcommittee in our space, and we have to come together to agree on that. Let's just agree here as a team. Look, I don't want to limit um, anyone's space. Uh, your team should meet, and if you end up with uh, exceeding four, if it's 10, as long as, of course, one of those, I hope, would be focused on that increased relationship with the COB, we will work with it. We'll make sure it's included. Uh, I think the community needs to see everything in an exhaustive manner anyway. So um, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I welcome other thoughts okay. today as well. Right. Great. Great. I mean, maybe, maybe it'll be one recommendation. I don't know, but that sounds great. I'm not putting a bet on one recommendation from you, Mr. Woods, but <laughs> I think I take me so you can hear me laughing myself. <laughs> gotcha. I hear you. Thank you for that point, though. So and to Mr. Woods' point, don't feel constrained at all on the four. In fact, I, I bet when my com subcommittee gets back together and huddles here by email, we'll, we'll find that we certainly see that because our, our conversation was lengthy as well. Um, any other questions, comments, or re responses here to the template here? Everyone feel comfortable just kind of huddling with their subcommittee. It can be virtual. That's totally fine. Um, we just want you to take the time and please use that template to fit out. And if you could send it to Amanda and myself um, ahead of time, even if it's the evening uh, that we're meeting, that will be helpful too. I wanted to also add, I think that 10 is fine. Um, I think that I would suggest that if you have that many great ideas, I would love to hear them. I think, um, and I think the larger community would probably, committee would probably like to hear them as well. So if you've got a bunch, let's hear them and we can always pare them down as a group collectively if we need to also. Good point. Very good point. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. And we may have some duplicates too, you know, on that would pick them down just naturally. So, but it's kind of nice to think that maybe we're all thinking on the same lines. So I say, don't worry about the number. Just if you've got a good idea, put it down. Absolutely. Agree. Thank you, Ms. Ballard. Any other comments here, uh, reflections here? Ms. Mr. Matthews, are you, user? I see your hand raises that from earlier. And not, yeah, that's from earlier. I'm sorry about that. No, no, it's totally fine. We just didn't want to move on without you. Um, Vice Chair Lucas, anything you would share on this before we uh, proceed here to the data um, update there? No, you got it. Right. So in, in summary here, uh, the subcommittee, if you could, if you haven't already come together, please do so. You can always reach us by email, phone as well if you have any questions. Um, we will get back in touch with Dr. Chairs. We'll ensure that we can schedule time to hear from him. I think uh, the committee will be uh, well served from hearing his, uh, his very diverse and professional and seasoned perspective on, on both sides of the issue, both as a, a retiree, but also as an educator and researcher in this space as well. Um, and then lastly here, I, I just want to acknowledge too, we will resend, I think it's probably a good custom for us to use uh, by Chair Lucas, 
let's just resend uh, the week before um, the WebEx invite to everyone, because I know by now it's probably lost in everyone's inboxes. You know, where's October 8th uh, WebEx? I had my, I was digging a bit myself today. So we'll just make that customary that when we send out the uh, agenda that we attach also the email we all receive uh, as well. Uh, just a question about that. I have tried to do that in the past. I believe I did that for uh, Dr. Jackson one time. And I think it, it has to come directly from IT, that it, it's like a specific to that person's email address. If that's incorrect, I'm happy to do that. But I know that when people have asked me to share the link and I have done that, it has not worked for them. Okay, then, then let me connect, um, let, let me just, chat with both Eric, Mr. Button, see what we can do um, on our end to get it recent. I, I just know that some people like myself are, you know, snowed in with emails, so we have to find them. So we'll try to make it as easy as we can for everybody. It's my hope there. Um, thanks everyone. Thank you, Vice Chair Lucas, great point on that too. Um, our remaining agenda item for this evening is um, the um, the data committee update. Ms. Bilal, we, we just, I recognize that that has been a great undertaking here. So I just want to extend the floor here if there were any updates or requests that you have of the committee here as we proceed with that. No, um, I think I'll just give a really quick recap. Are we over time? I don't. No, don't we're, not. we're not. Okay. Um, am I the last person? You are. Yeah. Okay. Um, is Peter on this call? He is, I believe. Dr. Villar? We see, well, let's, let me say this. I see a Peter. So I just, he's the, he's my first Peter. I come to talk about. Okay. <laughs> well, I, he shared some really great um, data with us on the community surveys. Well, let me just start from the beginning. So we talked obviously about these KPIs, what the industry standard standard is. Last week, we looked at the 2000-2001 traditional metrics that were reviewed for the current um, Metro Police Department. So what their goals are and what metrics and measuring what they're doing and how they're doing it. And I think in general, we found that they were doing what they were supposed to do based on the KPIs and the metrics in which they had been established. Um, I think we kind of, as a group, discussed that while those were not inappropriate and should be a part of what we may want to incorporate, um, the existing metrics don't measure the problems that we see in our community, which is why this committee is here in the first place. So we've got KPIs, we've got metrics, Looking at those, um, our police look like they're doing great. And this piece is what's missing. And we know that there is something that's missing and that's gonna be the extra KPIs that we've got to pull together. The one that we specifically discussed with, the, I mentioned last time that we're struggling with is how you measure culture. I think we talked about that, something that we wanna see um, change. And the big question is, how do you measure that? It's a very difficult thing to measure. Um, Peter did a great job of that. He took, I believe it was a four question survey that was done by the West Precinct. Um, and it was done through a five minute call in which um, they asked questions associated with perceived legitimacy of the police, police positive contact with the police and what the satisfaction was. And overall, they got really good results. They had a high satisfaction. And again, we look at that data and we're like, we see this, it looks good, but it just doesn't fit the story that we're seeing on the streets and seeing in our community. So um, we know that we want to see equality and procedural justice on the streets. I think that's what we're all um, here for. And I think that we have decided or we have thought that these community surveys may actually be a great link and piece to measuring culture. But the question surrounding it that we discussed is how do we do it? What type of survey do we use? How much does it cost? I know a lot of these surveys are very expensive. 
I've looked at a lot of this data. I've never actually conducted a lot of these. And so I suggested, is there any way we could do a survey monkey? I know all of us have done a million of those. And then the question brought up, well, how do you measure from people that don't have email? Um, the current survey that they used, they used it um, based on people's address um, for water bills. And yes, it's true that everybody has a water bill, but in communities um, where you're calling the owner of the house, that isn't the renter. Um, in communities um, in Dave or parts of Davidson County that are multi-housing, multi-units, they um, there, there's a group water bill for those. There isn't, you know, individuals. So we just did a lot of probably in the weeds and too much information for this committee about how to do a survey, how to get the names for who we actually question on the survey, how many questions we have and how much does it ask. Um, and when the data comes back, it should look like something that makes sense with what we're seeing in general in the community. So I think that's kind of what we had a lot of discussion about. And I don't know if Peter wants to add some of that, but um, and, and any feedback from any of you all about um, surveys when there isn't a budget for surveys <laughs> and, and how to measure culture is always helpful. One thing that I suggested, and I don't know if anyone has experience in this, but in the 90s, um, when I was working in the, at the Children's Defense Fund, we created a community safety audit um, and it was actually, in essence, a survey that was put together by the people of the community, and it was done by the people of the community, and it was done on foot, um, and it was done with volunteers. And I don't know if that's something in today's world that's even safer doable. That was called doing it the old-fashioned way <laughs> a while ago. But with community wanting to be more involved. Anyway, it's just something to think about. But if you have any ideas on um, how to conduct some type of survey and get reasonable data that Peter can measure and put in a graph that we can use to make um, a KPI out of and then in turn a metric, that would be great. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> I was going to say, we let's open the floor if there are any questions or thoughts here. I have one for you, Mira. Thank you, first of all, for serving on the data committee. I uh, just want to make sure everybody knows KPI stands for key performance indicators. You know, we're trying to figure out what metrics to use um, to judge the change in the progress uh, that the department uh, hopefully will be making. Um, you know, the Community Oversight Now and NOAA and other community organizations um, worked very hard to um, establish the COB. And that required a great deal of um, engagement with the community. Uh, NOAA has a very robust integrated voter engagement process. So it's very possible that we can partner with some of these community organizations um, and the COB to, you know, the Human Rights Commission and the um, Community Oversight have been partnering on these community town halls recently. And they're going to be, uh, Dr. Valier and Ms. Orozco are going to be producing a report that they've been graciously offered to share with us. Hopefully that will be a way to receive some feedback from the community. But I can tell you as someone who spent, you know, 20 years of my career working in the community, working in the field, um, there's going to be a great deal of distrust at, at providing feedback, uh, especially about the police department. And I think that partnering with uh, organizations such as Community Oversight Now, uh, with NOAA, with Gideon's Army, is going to be crucial to kind of be able for them to feel safe enough and comfortable enough to share that information. Um, so uh, I think figuring that piece out is going to be huge to this process. So thank you to the data committee for doing that work. How do we maintain consistent community feedback? 
Um, you know, that's, a, that's a really great point. You know, when you think about who's asking the question, how honest is somebody really going to be? And even I think if it's an over the phone interview, um, still, if you know that it's somebody from the police department calling, that makes perfect sense. About trusting the reliability of that data. Thank you, Ms. Bilal. Any other questions, comments here? I just like to give people a moment to unmute because I have trouble finding the button myself, honestly. Um, okay, well, fantastic. Uh, so we'll look forward to next week. Oh, yep. Actually, I'm sorry. I didn't. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. It's actually a little. It's off topic of what we're talking about now. But it's okay. Go right ahead, uh, Miss Lucas, the young lady that you had as a guest at the beginning that told her story. I feel like I didn't really get the impact because I could tell she was nervous and obviously she was very emotional and I didn't want to push her to get more information. But all I understood was she turned her uh, lit her up or you know turned on his lights. Pulled it, followed her into her driveway, arrested her for something she didn't do, and then she had a court battle. Is there any way we could get more details of what actually happened? Just so we could, I mean, I feel like, I know what she was saying, and, and I feel like you know her story. I could tell from Ms. Lucas' reaction that there's something significant there, but I didn't get it. Right. Um, yes, I'd be very happy to share with you what I shared with Ms. Davis. I believe it was from the Nashville scene about how, um, she had no criminal record. She was had done absolutely nothing. The, they turned on the lights. They said that she waited too long to pull over. She was almost to her house, but it was like 500 feet. You know, it, it, they arrested her for, I, I believe it was reckless driving and um, resisting arrest, excuse me. Said that they had to call for backup because she was cooperative, that proved to be true. But I, I'm happy to share the article with you. I, um, her, she was represented by an attorney who worked for many years with Noah. It, it was a very egregious example of being harassed. As a NOAA member and in the groups and the town halls that we conducted in advance of the community oversight process, I cannot tell you the number of stories that we heard about people being harassed in the community, um, being stopped, being asked for their ID, not given any reason why. They weren't speeding. They did not run a stop sign. They looked, they ran it, and they went to go give the ID back, and they threw the ID in the bushes. I mean, I cannot overstate the stories in my career from clients of mine. Like I said, I worked in the communities. I've worked in every public housing um, community in Nashville. You cannot believe the stories that people, it, it, you cannot dismiss this as people being, you know, hyperbolic or, you know, these are um, law-abiding, hardworking people who've never had any, like, Angie never had anything. I mean, there's no, didn't have a expired tag or nothing. Um, and that's why I brought up the issue of quotas. Did that officer have a quota that they were seeking to meet back when traffic stops were being um, focused? But it's been devastating um, to her. She's an extraordinarily intelligent, hardworking person and very shy um, on, on top of it. She's a really neat lady. And it just, um, it, it, we, we have to stop that from happening. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised. I've been on the other side of those stops. Yeah. But I just felt like I, I didn't want to push her because she sounded nervous and emotional. And but I, but I felt like I didn't. I, I want to hear the story. So if you could show that, that would be great. I would I'd be happy to. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. I have the just... same questions, by the way. I, I too have the same questions. I always hold out like, wait, let's hear the exact circumstances. But it, it is as bad as it sounded. Yeah. And just really quickly, um, Mr. Delgado, if you uh, have a copy of the testimony schedule, um, her name is linked to that article already there. So it should, if you hover over it and click it, it should um, bring it up for you. Because um, I similarly had 
similar questions. And so when Ms. Lucas sent it to me, I included it there for everyone to see. Um, Mr. Lewis, I'm happy to make sure you get a copy of that as well. And again, just to be clear, I'm not questioning the validity of your claim. I just felt I didn't get the weight of it. I didn't, like, in her story. So I, and I, and I missed that uh, testimony. So I'll look it up there. Thank you. Okay. No problem. We can resend it too, um, as well. Anything, uh, any other additional comments, announcements here from members of the committee or, uh, of course, Mr. Lewis here as well? One quick, one quick question just about the community surveys. Again, besides NOAA and Gideon's Army and the Community Oversight Board, are there any other agencies that would be um, good in being involved with a community survey? Ms. Blah, I think um, I would uh, recommend Gideon's Army just because of their grassroots engagement in, in the community. Um, and recently, quite frankly, they were just uh, received, uh, I believe it was at least city, maybe statewide acknowledgement and award for the way that they are uh, engaging the community in a really unique way. So that they come to mind for me, I'm not sure for others. Uh, I'll, I'll suggest the Equity Alliance might be another good organization that, that has a, a very significant reach. I would say Turk, the Tennessee Immigrant Refugee Rights Coalition. It's a little bit of a tangent, but the Metro Health Department does these types of, uh, does this type of outreach well also. And if we're looking at it in kind of that same space there, if we're looking at ways to engage and get the voice of you there in a unique way, I would say the Basis Center, um, some of their leadership will be a great space to connect us as well. Um, you know, Ms. Roberson is, an, uh, Sharon Roberson is a member of, I um, believe it's the Workforce Committee. Don't don't quote me here, maybe um, I see Mr. Button nodding, but um, she's- the Actually, communities, communities. Please? Okay, perfect. Uh, but she leads the uh, communities, but also is the uh, leader of the YWCA uh, as well. So that their work in the uh, women's shelters may be an incredible connection there too. Mr. Binner. Oh. Everybody's not available here. Any other organizations there? Thank you. If anyone thinks of any, I would love for you to email me. Of course. Thank you. Any additional comments or announcements here from anyone? Here's someone to meet. I think that's our phone visitor there. Uh, so we'll be uh, queued up for next week. Uh, we'll go, uh, we can take volunteers. And if not, we'll just go in the order of how we're listed there already um, on the sheet. But I want to thank everyone, first of all, in advance. Uh, thank you now for what you've done, but also in advance for what I know will be a great meeting next week. Uh, and how about October? I, I almost said September, but we are in October. So. Um, good to see the, the change uh, with everyone, too. With that, I'll wish everyone a, a good evening. Mr. Lewis, welcome again. We're so glad to have you a part of the commission. Yeah, you're on mute, but I did see you say uh, uh, thank you, too. I think I read your lips correctly there. <laughs> Perfect. Have a good evening, sir. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.